Welcome everybody to Kula Brajrana Europe Online. Um, as always, we give a tiny introduction of what Brajrana means, right? It's the illuminating, illuminating the Kula or also allowing the light of the Kula to shine. This, this nice uh, sharing of light among each other. As always, we ask you to please your mic to please mute your microphones, and if you need to ask anything, use the chat. But we ask you not to use the chat to send messages among each other, uh, because then we can use the chat properly for questions. Uh, there is a picture, the pictures of who the Kula Brajrana members are, country coordinators of our Anusara School of Hatha Yoga that make, came together to make this uh, possible. We are following the steps of Lisa Long and Maduri Martin in the States who created the Samudra Shakti online. And we were so excited about that, that we decided to create the one in Europe. Oh, here should have been what's coming today. Sorry about that. Uh, today we will have obviously Barbara No. We are super happy about this. Uh, we all know and we all really love Barbara, such a long time um, Anusari teacher. Can I, how do I go? Stop here. Oh, there we go. Let's go back to the normal screen. Such a long time Anusara teacher and such a international teacher, right? Coming from Australia, but living in, in Germany for such a long time and now between Bali and Germany. So Barbara, I let the microphone for you. Thank you so much. And any questions, any things, please uh, write on the chat. I will be monitoring the chat. Thank you. So lovely to meet you all. So lovely to see you again, those of us who have already met before. Um, I've reached that grandma stage of life where I'm going to have to put my glasses on sometimes, take them off sometimes. Um, and uh, I, what, I, what I won't be doing is I won't read things in the chat because I think that will uh, interrupt the flow of the lecture too much. So I'm going to rely on Letizia to check the chat if there's something you need from me, um, German speakers, I understand you were promised uh, or you know, this was announced as having German translation. Um, I decided even though I'm fluent in German, it just messes with my head to try and switch back and forth. And so we originally said Yulia will do the translation. Now she has Wi-Fi problems, so it's not gonna be reliable um, and particularly the audio won't be reliable. And so we decided, let's do it like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask some of my friends who I know I can trust to do this. Sylvia Zoma, I know I could trust you to write in the chat or put up a hand. You know, there's that way you can put up a hand. Could you please repeat that in German? And then I will offer a German translation nach Bedarf. Okay, so as needed rather than word by word, because it's an interesting thing. A lot of German speakers, they understand most things quite well, and some have very good English, and some feel less sure about some technical terms. So it's very different. It's not like in Scandinavia, where every, so everyone seems to have the same level of, of English, right? Um, or in Japan, everyone has the same level of English. <laughs> And in Germany, it can be different. And I don't want you to feel shy. Put up a hand and tell me, and then I can do a, a quick translation if it's needed. So when uh, Letizia was doing the, uh, the intro, I had a sudden flashback of the time when I first heard of Anasara Yoga. And I'd been teaching yoga full time for six or seven years. And it was going terribly well. But I kind of felt you know, like imposter syndrome. I kind of felt like the students really like this, but really, honestly, I have hardly any idea what I'm doing. I really kind of, I'm just getting through this because I, you know, I used to be a dancer. I'm familiar with working with the body, but I know damn well that there's a lot I don't know. And if someone comes to me and says, I hurt my neck last week in your class, Barbara, or I don't know why, but every time I do that pose, my knee hurts. I had no idea what to do or to say. So I was looking for education and 
I kind of looked at things. I was like, oh, oh I don't know, the five-year or the 100-year Iyengar training, that looked a little too tough for me. And then, you know, there weren't as many trainings available or schools offering certification as there are now, because I'm talking 19, no, not nine, yeah, no, I'm talking 2000, 19, 2006, 2007. And then I came across Anasara Yoga, that's another story for another day, that's a, a nice story, but, and found out about the certification having, you know, what was at that time considered these incredibly high standards. And then I said, but where can I do the certification? And I was told in America. And I thought, well, that's never going to happen. <laughs> I'm not good. But then it did kind of happen bit by bit over time. And now it, look at that. Now it's all happening. You know, now we have our community here in Europe. Now there isn't this thing of like, oh, if you want to do NSRA certification, you have to go and do trainings in the US or you have to, you know, go. So I just had that little moment of... Um, like a flashback of how far away Anasara Yoga used to be for us here in Europe. And now it's right here in your living room. I'm going to try to move briskly through the topics because we don't have much time. And I actually want to give you quite a lot. Let's see how it goes. My inspiration for our meeting and for our talk is that um, very recently, I've just come back from Bali, I started teaching weekly classes and I haven't, I haven't done that for quite a long time, not only because of the pandemic, but just my focus is running teacher trainings and educational programs. And so bit by bit over the years, I just didn't have the capacity to keep on teaching weekly classes. The good old 90 minute class, which is the foundation of, you know, what you work towards for your Anasara certification, the 90 minute golden, you know, Anasara class. And no one is teaching Anasara yoga in Bali, as far as I know, no, at least no certified teachers or teachers who are registered with the Anasara school. And at this studio where I was asked to teach the, the owner of the resort you know, who's a yogi himself. And he, he used to, you know, he's very familiar with all the different yoga styles and he really likes Anasara yoga. And the, the principle of his yoga studio is everybody should try different kinds of yoga. So there's, with me as a guest teacher, Anasara yoga. And there's everything from yin yoga, which I would consider to be the slowest yoga on that um, program. Yin yoga to rocket ashtanga. I went to the rocket ashtanga class. I nearly died. Um, I, would, I, I had just started setting my foundation and it was time to do the next pose, right? Like I, I just, that was too fast for me, but I was quite fascinated by the, you know, there's a group of people who love practicing in that way. I went to the Kundalini yoga class with a wonderful teacher, Daphna. And I thought, oh, wow, I, yeah, sure. I'd forgotten about this particular magic that happens in a Kundalini yoga class. Kundalini yoga is amazing. It's not my personal path and most favorite, most favorite path of practice, but I really appreciate it. And I went to some really cool vinyasa classes from an Italian teacher called Kalota. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's why people love vinyasa yoga. This is what you get out of this kind of class. And I went to a more somatic uh, movement-based yoga class too, where it's all about sensing sort of into your organs and your skin and your cells. And, and I was like, oh my God, I never talk about this kind of thing when I'm teaching my classes, because in my classes, I'm trying to get people's thighs back and get them to lift their side body and engage their shoulder loop. And, you know, I'm languaging different things. And I thought, oh, but this is really cool too. This is for a moment, it made me feel like, God, you know, how do you get, how, how can I, you know, only share this when there are all these other wonderful things too? And it just brought me full circle to this idea that each style of yoga, each tradition, method, school, whatever you want to talk, uh, call it, I generally don't call Anasara yoga a style because I think, you know, things come in and out of style, <laughs> you know. I call it a method yeah um, but whatever method or school or tradition um, you know that has its community that loves practicing in that way that's because that particular method or approach to practice 
really has its own unique benefits and its own gold, that which I would call the gold. And it made me think then, okay, here I am teaching at this studio where there are all these really cool teachers and everyone's teaching different styles of yoga and I've gone to the different classes and I thought all the, you know, there was something really beautiful to be had in each of those classes. And it made me think, so what is, what is the unique special experience you, you have in an Anasara class? And for me, practicing Anasara yoga, it's a little bit like a fish in water. You know, I've been practicing for so long that I've forgotten that there's any other way to practice. <laughs> and so it just made me, it almost reignited my passion for this form of practice because I thought, oh yeah, this is what you get out of it if you do Anasara. And this is, these are the things I want to give people in these weekly classes, in the 90-minute classes. And so I would like to um, guide you into a little uh, self-reflection, a little, a kind of a meditation, if you will. And if you feel comfortable to just close your eyes now, please, you can close your eyes. It's a nice way of drawing the senses away from all the stimulation and information around us and turning the light of your consciousness back towards yourself. And so it's a self-reflection where I'm just going to ask you the question. And this question at this stage does not require an answer. The purpose of the question is just to create a vibration and for you to see how you meet and match that vibration. And the question is, what is the unique experience of Anasara yoga for you. This is not placing Anasara yoga above any other styles of yoga or any other methods or schools. But we recognize there's something different to be experienced, something, a different gold, a different magic to be experienced in each of these schools, methods, and traditions. So what is the unique experience that you know in your body, in your heart, in your mind that for you can only be had through Anasara Yoga? So not, not what is the unique experience of doing yoga in general. All yoga is pretty awesome. More specifically, what is the goal for you. And as you allow that question to just reverberate, you might like to deepen your breath. With the inhale, it's almost like you drink the question in a, a little more fully. You drink that question into your cells. What is the gold for you? And as you exhale, you can just allow the body to soften and relax. And as the body softens and relaxes just a little bit more, it might even be the body that expresses some kind of response to the question. What is this magic? What is the gold? There's something that you get to experience with yourself, with your body, with your mind, with your heart, with your whole soul that you don't get to experience in this way in, with any other form of practice. And now please honour your unique individual experience with your practice of Anasara Yoga by gently drawing, taking your hands to meet in front of your heart. And we're all going to have slightly different experience of Anasara Yoga.
on your unique experience. Those experiences you've had that have been absolutely transformational, absolutely freedom enhancing, absolutely nourishing for your body, heart, mind, and soul. Because that's the goal, that's the magic you want to share with your students. You're going to be teaching from that place. I'm going to lead the invocation. It might be a different melody to what you often sing. I'll sing one line and then you will repeat it after me. And then I'll sing the next line and you repeat it after me. We'll begin with one arm together. Deep inhale. Oh. Shivaya Gurave Together Om Namah Shivaya Gurave Satchitananda Murtai Satchitananda Murtai Nishparapanchaya shantaya Nishparapanchaya shantaya Niralambaya tejase Niralambaya tejase Oh. With your eyes still closed, lower your head a little and your hands. And I, I know that right now I just feel a lot of gratitude for having found a practice that supports me so well, nourishes me so well. And so you may. Feel similarly gratitude or some kind of yeah, sense of having received a big gift through your practice. So take your hands down and you can slowly open your eyes. And now I would love for you to write, and it could really be a very succinct, a kind of a sutra write into the chat your goal. What is this unique experience that, that is only possible through Anasara Yoga for you personally? I'm going to say, as, a, as an, a former ballet dancer who had aches and pains nonstop her whole life, Anasara Yoga was just the first time I got to be pain-free. It just feel really good in my body to feel like I'm doing something healthy and it wasn't like that in every other kind of yoga. So that was something very magic for me with Anasara. Please write your goal into the chat, a little sutra. For me, it would be pain-free yoga. You might feel moved to write twice. You know, My second one would be uplifting my heart certain a kind of joy yeah there's something joyous for me in the practice you might all enjoy reading each other's comments And as perhaps a few of you might still be thinking and writing, I'm, I'm going to continue speaking. And so you're all free to just read those uh, comments in the chat. So it's a little bit of a sort of sharing going on. 
So I was very excited when um, Julia, Letizia and Leah asked me to do this. And at the same time, I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, what a what am, I, what am I going to give the Anasara community and, you know, in this context, our European Anasara community? And I thought, goodness, I don't know what I have to give. And then I thought, I want to just give you what my teachers gave me. So um, I, I'd like to honour my teachers. All the work I do, everything I say in the yoga room, all the positive experiences I have with all the people I work with, this I can, uh, I owe to my teachers. So I had the great fortune to study a lot with John Friend, the genius behind the method. And uh, I really learned so much from him about being a teacher, not just about the alignment or the philosophy, but really being a teacher. And another great teacher who um, definitely every single time I teach, I'm, I'm, I'm digging out of this resource of um, things that I learned from Ross Rayburn. So Ross Rayburn has been a, a teacher I studied with quite a lot. And Desiree Rumbach. Desiree is uh, also a, like a big sister for me, big sister in yoga. And uh, all of them, but I, particularly what comes to mind for me with Desiree is that um, she... I learned so much from just being with her, just her as a person, her as a, the way she conducts herself as a human being is very inspiring for me. And another one of my great teachers, Kachi Ananda, I didn't study as much asana specifically with Kachi, but she's been, a, a um, she's kind of held my hand, you know, when I've had difficulties, you know, that's really solidarity, you know, what do you, what do you call that? Like support. I've really experienced through these teachers and particularly my female big sister teachers like Desiree and Kachi. That's cool. That's support. When we take time for each other, we listen to each other. If someone's having a crisis, I used to have very uh, frequent a crisis very frequently about once a year, I thought I'd have to give up teaching because I was so terrible. Um, and, you know, these, these teachers uh, really held my hand and led the way. And I studied also with Sienna Sherman, and I didn't study a lot and in depth with Sienna, but I must say the few times I studied with her, I took so much with me, you know. So I just loved observing these people, observing these experienced and highly gifted and very dedicated teachers. And one thing that I observed that they all did in their teaching, this is going to be my number one sort of thing I want to share with you. It's probably nothing new, but it is what I really thought was outstanding about these teachers. And it was their observation skills, the way they would really observe what was happening in the room, but also with the individuals. Now, that is a big skill to be able to keep your eye on, you know, and they'd have big workshops, you know, keep your eye on 50 people. Or maybe it was 200 people sometimes, you know, and also have a heart open and your eyes open for each individual. I was very impressed by this. Uh, I'd had many other experiences of teachers, um, perhaps just more like just reciting what they know. You could have been listening almost to a radio, right? A, a broadcast, a very valuable broadcast. But what struck me about these teachers was that they really noticed the people they were working with. And um, these observation skills included really figuring out when it comes to um, demonstrations or examples from the group, which person, if I bring them forward for a demonstration, is it going to benefit this, that this person is the subject of the demonstration that they chose so well, they chose someone who the subject, the person doing the demo, they benefited so much. Yeah and everybody watching as well. 
you know, so really I, I, I started trying to do that, started trying to always before, way before I got to the demonstration part of any class or workshop, already really looking at each person in the room and noticing already, oh, goodness, if we do anything with knees, I really must go up and have a look at this lady's feet. And, oh, if we do anything with lower back, you know, if anything comes about up about lower back pain, I think it might be interesting to work in down dog with that person like that. So give me an indication. Is that um, old news? Is it nice to be reminded of that kind of approach with observation? Is it the first time you're hearing it from that perspective? So let me just have a little sign. Is this, is this um, do this, maybe this kind of a sign. Is this the first time you're hearing this kind of perspective of observing students? No. And is it nice to be reminded that this could be a very foundational part of the work? Yeah. And the really how we can do great service. Yeah. And who might even feel like, oh, it sounds really difficult. It sounds impossible. How can you do that? You know, does anyone feel like it's kind of asking a bit too much? Okay, cool. I'm just going to flip over to the other side because I could only see one group at a time. So I'm now looking at another group of people or some, oh, not all the cameras are on there. So that happens in Zoom sometimes that if I flip over the page, I actually don't see many of the other people. Okay, I'm going to stay on the first page. So getting into a more, let's say, classroom situation, particularly with people you work with more regularly. So this is going to be probably more of a reminder than anything that's really new to you. But I'd like to impress upon you today that with your observation of the students, and this is key to delivering the gold, okay? You have to watch if they are really doing the action. Don't just teach the actions. Actually watch, are they really doing the actions? And I'm going to give you a specific template now it, shortly on how to observe that, all right? Now, some of you are laughing. I wonder why you're laughing. Is it too obvious or is it? Because we run? agree with you. Ah, because okay. we totally okay. agree with you. Okay. Now, I want to say that I'm the oldest of four children. And my youngest sibling, we have the same parents. My youngest sibling is 14 years younger than I am. Even when I was seven years old at school, if the teacher needed to leave the room, guess which of the children in the group, the teacher would leave in charge. Guess who? Me. I've always been a little bit bossy. Big sister, little siblings, always in charge. My dad is a very authoritarian figure. My dad has an air of authority. He's a martial arts instructor. I come from a martial arts family. Before doing yoga, I came from ballet. The first thing we do when we walk in the room or when we start to our training with our teachers is we bow to them. We place our teachers in, for that situation, for that context, definitely in, in the role of authority. And we say, please tell me what to do. So that was maybe an easy pair of shoes for me to get into this sort of that, that aspect of the seat of the teacher. And I just bring it up because in case you feel shy about insisting that people do the actions. I want you to reconsider and see that from the perspective. You know, maybe you don't want to be pushy. You don't want to be bossy. You don't want to put people under pressure. I want you to see it from the perspective that I cannot help you receive the gold of this practice if you are not doing the actions. And I know there are people who are much more... Um, gentle temperament than me they don't come from a martial arts family and they don't have a strong pitta dominant nature as I do and they weren't ballet dancers right we like maniacs the ballet dancers are maniacs when it comes to discipline and hard work and all of that so I understand some people have a much more gentle nature you know than maybe I have but I've seen that kind of teaching it's nice but I get this sense that, ah, oh, but the students aren't, and every kind of yoga is nice, really. Literally every yoga, it's like with pizza, 
you know, some say there's no bad pizza. Pizza's always, there's no bad sex. Sex is always, you know, there's just some things, even the bad version of it is quite good. Yoga, even bad yoga, I, I, I get something out of it. As, as long as there's good shavasana at the end, you are going to feel good afterwards, right? But we're interested in a bit more than that. Like, how can I really help you to receive the therapeutic benefits of these actions? And you're not going to get the benefits if you don't do the actions. And I've been, you know, I'm kind of a bit of a, I'm almost a bit, you know, rigid in my discipline much, sometimes and sort of like, if, these are, if, the, if this is the way to do it and if this, this is how my teachers told me to do it, then I'm really going to do it like this, right? So I've always practiced with people who say in class, I have some pain, I have a problem. From the beginning before I was certified or anything, I always said, can, I, can you please spend 10 minutes with me after class? And I'd go outside and I'd work with them. And I've always done that. I've always been interested in how can we get you out of pain? How can we get you to have these therapeutic benefits that I that I got from this practice and so I really stuck to that always working with someone until we got an improvement and this is a question uh this is something Ross Rayburn taught me to ask always ask when you're working with someone and you're trying out the different actions and you're working towards you you want some kind of progress improvement less pain less discomfort more strength more stability more freedom more movement, more ease, you're working towards all those things. And then what you can do is you apply one action, you've got to check that they're really doing the action, and then you ask, do you now feel better, same, or worse? Three questions you can ask. Because if you ask, how do you feel now? They're going to go, oh, mm, uh. but if you say, Okay, now lift your side body higher. Does your lower back now feel better, same or worse? Three very specific questions, okay? I learned that from Ross Rayburn. All right, so in the most charming, benevolent, yeah, with goodwill, only goodwill behind it in the most charming way, you're going to absolutely insist they do the actions if you want therapeutic benefits. Because in my experience now of, I guess I've been using the principles since about, I, did, I, did, I don't think I really knew what I was doing in 2007 when I started. I'd say I'd, I'd say I'd give myself 2000, like 2009. From about 2009 onwards, I had some idea of what I was doing with the principles. And my, in my personal experience, the only time the principles don't work is when the people are not doing them. Like literally, it's the only time it doesn't work. They're not doing the principles. They're not doing the actions. Okay. So we live, we live in a bit of a culture of molly coddling. Does everybody know what molly coddling is? So auf Deutsch wäre das so in, in, in Watte umhüllen. Molly coddling is you sort of wrap people up in cotton wool and you don't want to put them under pressure and you don't, you don't really. But if we want someone, if, if someone's coming and saying they have pain, it means, okay, are you willing to change your postural habits? All right, so if you want to change your postural habits, I'm going to help you, but it means you're going to have to do things that... Could, it's an effort. It's not the comfortable, easy way you're used to doing it. And so it might require some effort. And that's, that's a little bit opposite maybe this modern, what I sense a lot in the modern culture of kind of just wrap everyone up in cotton wool and, and, and oh, everyone's, which is true, everyone's so stressed from their normal life that we don't want to put them under pressure at yoga as well. I would come from a completely different attitude that I want to help you experience transformation, more freedom in your body. These effects with the body totally open up the heart and mind as well. And you're not going to get the benefits unless you really do the actions. Okay. So how can I really look at someone and see if they're doing the actions? Now, I know we have a lot of German speakers uh, in the call. So I'm going to just mention that in this book, I have the Tadasana template here. Okay. 
And this is the part of my book that explains the optimal blueprint. But I actually go into also, I created something called the Tadasana template, which is really how to apply the actions to Tadasana. It's kind of like a summary. I, I organized that at a certain point in time when I was teaching so many uh, guest workshops and conferences and things where no one in the room knew the principles. And I just needed a really quick and easy way to get them to do the actions and sort of organize them into, to, into good postural alignment. So I'm gonna tell you what the actions are, like the summary of the Tadasana template. And it's really about looking at people, and you've probably done this before, but it's just about me tonight drawing your attention to how much more you could do it, um, is really looking, observing relationships in the body. So are the, are the souls of other, sorry, the arches of the feet lifted? You're really looking then at their feet. Are the arches of their feet lifted? Is the top of the shin bone forward? When I look at the side of them compared to the side of their hip, is the top of the shin bone forward or is the knee, the back of the knee, back? Can I see a little curve, an inward curve at the back of the knee? This would indicate to me the shin is forward. Really looking at that. Is the top of the thigh bone in relationship to the shin, the knee, top of the shin, is it more back or more forward, right? So you really look at those things. How can I tell if the head of the thigh bone is more back? There's a little inward curve at the front of the groin. Is there a little bit of curve in the lower back? Or do I see the vertebrae, the little bony bits, protruding bony bits of the, of the uh, lumbar spine sticking out through their skin? Do I get a sense that the side ribs are lifting up away from the pelvis? Or do I see them very short from the armpits down to the pelvis? You know, is side body long happening? When I look at them from the side, what's the relationship of the shoulders and ears? Is the head forward or is it more back? Or you, generally it's not back, it's just on top of the neck. But is the head more forward? Ears and shoulders, what are ears and shoulders? How are they relating to each other? Is the throat open, the neck long on all four sides? Or is it more like the chin is down, there's a double chin, there's like wrinkles in here in the front and the back of the neck is flat. Am I observing, you know, I'm teaching shoulder loop, am I observing that the throat is open? Because if the chin is down, then they're not doing shoulder loop, they're not doing the actions. And this is never about finding fault with the student. So here my next little piece of... Um, advice for teaching. This is about guiding, always guiding students towards the goal, let's say, towards that which we are moving, uh, uh, that, that we are aiming for. So when we're guiding people and also when I'm observing people, my, I do my best, my very best to never make them wrong. You can write that down. Never make the student wrong. Another thing I learned from Ross Rayburn was to never say no. People who've trained with me know this. So let's say I say to a student, step your right foot forward. They step their left foot forward. It would be very human and a very natural response to go, no, no, other foot. I taught myself to never say no. I say, step the right foot forward. They step their left foot forward. I say, all my students say no. I say, good. And now take the other foot forward. And it's not insincere to say good. They were putting effort in. <laughs> They were trying to do what they thought I was asking them to do. 
So always encourage and guide towards where you want to move to and don't make it the student's problem that they didn't understand you the first time. That would be one piece of advice I have. Classic is when you're trying to get someone to get more inner, more inward curve in their lower back and down dog, right? And you say, you know, with that block between your thighs, at the top of your thighs, move your block back. What do they do? They move it forward. Lower back gets round. And I always say, good. Because actually it is quite good that they just did the opposite. Because now I can say, you just moved the block forward, your lower back is round. Notice how that feels. And now we're gonna do the opposite, move the block back. Notice how your lower back changes. So always guiding towards where you wanna to move to. So this is um, very cool if we can start doing that with our language, that there's no no. Occasionally you need, you'll find you need to describe the contrast, yeah? but as much as possible, uh, affirmative language. Um, I'm gonna skip something that I actually wanted to do. No, I, I, well, I won't completely skip it, but I'm gonna keep it very short. And with this topic of language, I wrote a note about inclusive language. So let me, let me explain what I mean. I find it so, important that people of every single different kind of body size shape and proportions feels welcome in yoga class every kind of age every kind of uh, physical state there aren't many things where really everyone can come and I'm going to also go as far as saying there aren't many schools of yoga where everyone can come and that is one of the very amazing things about Anasara Yoga. You can come as an athletic, strong, and very flexible practitioner, and you will get a good workout at this class. You can come as a stiffer, older, weaker person uh, with not a lot of, um, you know, who isn't a former gymnast, and you are going to be able to work um, very safely and very beneficially with your body and within your limits and with 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 the body you have. So something that I think is so wonderful about the principles is that it's not about, we know this, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but perhaps that's just an added perspective. And because we work with principles that actually help people to work with their own anatomy, everybody can work in, in, with, these, with these principles. I don't know if everybody can go to Rocket Ashtanga class. I did go to the class, but I didn't feel like that's a kind of practice that is accessible to everybody. And I think that is something very uh, wonderful about the Anasara method. We can make that really accessible to everybody. So just a little word on language because a big part of our method and I, I know that I was greatly impressed with that once I heard it from John Friend and once I started to understand it that the real the truth behind what we're doing as Anasara yoga teachers is actually we don't really care if they can do trikonasana actually we're not so worried about their downward dog it's all a forewand how do you say it's all um just a reason, an excuse to get them to move towards their hearts. So we use the physical practice. It's actually just a whole excuse to, to talk about something else, right? And this something else ultimately, and that's why we make use of these um, tantric, you know, the tantric philosophy as the foundation for the philosophy and the, and the theme, it's very much about revealing this innate goodness. And in my language, and that's when I got it, that I was like, oh my God, this is the perfect yoga for me because actually it's about dealing with our sense of unworthiness. For me, Anasara Yoga was the only one I came across that philosophically there was a, an answer, a, a response to the question of what do I do with this sense of I'm not good enough? What do I do with this sense of unworthiness? 
How can I work with that? And we have that the malas, the three malas in, our, in the philosophy, and that this is part of the curriculum. I, that blew me away. Oh, my God. The problem, the worthiness issue gets attention in this yoga method, in this yoga school, that blow, blew me away. So as part of that, as yoga teachers, we want to, as the Anasara yoga teachers, we want to make sure our language doesn't trigger this unworthiness topic. What we're working towards is how can I guide you in such a way that you begin to develop more appreciation for yourself? So things like just, I'm going to say that trigger areas are things like if someone is stiff, or if someone is weak, weakness might relate to age, body size, body proportion. These could be areas, kappa proportionen. These are areas that people might feel unworthy or sensitive about. So we can watch our language, you know, we can often say things, maybe we mean well, we might say something like, if your wrists feel weak, then do this, this and that. I'm just going to open my phone because I made a note here about an alternative to speaking in that way. So if your wrists feel weak, now on a, on a truly for me, there's nothing wrong with feeling weak. It doesn't make you better or worse than someone who feels strong. But on the level of human emotions, people can be feel triggered, can feel triggered by like, oh my God, I'm the weak one. Everyone's balancing Vashistasana. I have to come out of the pose earlier. It hurts my wrists. I'm not strong enough. You don't know. There could be a whole lot of inner critic chatter going on for somebody about that. So my suggestion would be. Instead of saying, if your wrists feel weak, you know, in Vashi Stasana, if your wrist feels weak, then put one knee down on the floor. An alternative would be, if, if you feel a strain in your wrists, when we do this variation, you have the option to return to the previous pose. It's more like choosing what's suitable for you. So I like to use anatomical orientation so that students can make good decisions for themselves. This is straining my wrists, therefore I'm going to return to another uh, variation. If you have a rounded lower back, don't do a forward bend from here. You know, that would be a classic example of not very affirmative uh, language. Here I say, I've made a note. Um, if you feel free and long in your spine, from here, move into a forward bend, rather than if your lower back is round, don't do it. If you feel long and free in your lower back, then you can move forward into a forward bend. And otherwise, remain where you are and continue to lift the side body and create more length, more freedom for your lower back. So it's followed up with an instruction to help that person gain the, same, the experience you're talking about, the length and the freedom. One more example. Is this interesting for you or is this useless? This is, okay, good. Kind of hard to get the vibe from your little faces on the screen. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay, one more. You see, I never thought it was, I never, I I've always been very flexible. I've never considered that to be an achievement. I was born flexible. It's not an achievement. It doesn't make me better than anybody else. And yet for people who, who are stiff or tight in their bodies, it can really be one of the things that makes them sometimes feel unworthy in a yoga class. So I learned to stop talking about, you know, to, uh, trying to find different language around this, this idea of stiffness, okay? So rather than, if you're, if you're a stiff person, do this. Or 
if you have tight hips, take your feet wider apart. So some language like this might be nicer. If you'd like more space and freedom for your hips, step your feet wider apart. So I'm not even talking about, are you stiff? Are you flexible? If you'd like, let's say we're about to go into forward bend, Uttanasana. Or maybe we are in forward bend, Uttanasana. If you feel like your hips are tight, take your feet wider apart. Rather, if you'd like more space and freedom for your hips, step your feet wider apart. So this is all still relating to how can I deliver the gold? How can I help this person get this experience that is so unique to this practice? All right, the final topic, which I'm going to squeeze into our last three minutes. How, how on time do we need to be, Julia? Is it good that I'm really super on, like Swiss about it or... Swiss or me, German about it? For me, you can go over. Letizia is our chief, chief of ah. command here. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think everybody's excited. So we can we can say 10, 15 more minutes. What do we say? Oh, not 15, but maybe Ten. it might be five. Might be five. Yeah, five, yeah. it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So just to wrap that up, the observation skills, insisting on doing the actions, using the template of tadasana and which which you know really relates to the optimal blueprint to insist that people really do the actions you are doing them a favor it's like when i would go uh to my dental hygiene hygiene person zahnreinigung and she would start getting out all these little tools she's like Frau no, you could be putting this in your teeth and you could be doing this and you could be doing that. And hast du das schon, haben Sie das schon mit Natron probiert? You know, like telling me all these things that I could do. And it's boring. You know, some of that is a little bit boring. Like, does any, is anybody a fan of using their um, dental floss? daily dental floss does anybody love using dental floss I mean it's annoying it hurts your fingers you've got to put your fingers in your... but you get benefits you get benefits so my my I'm thinking of the lady who does my teeth twice a year and she always talks to me coaches me through like you really have to do this and it would be really good if you do this and it's her job and it's a good thing so as your as somebody's yoga teacher you're doing them a favor to really insist no you should do this and really try to do this once a day and you know insisting on the action so that they get they get the benefits watching our language so that we're not triggering anybody and they can really receive. See, as soon as we get triggered and it might even just be someone saying no, just hearing the word no, something in your body will tighten. And you might not have a nervous breakdown or something, but a little part of you just kind of flinches when somebody says, no, you did that wrong, or no, that's not what I meant. Or, so taking away this word, no, guiding towards using affirmative language, all of that, it just helps the student to stay open to receive so that they can keep receiving, receiving, receiving what, you, what, you're, what you're offering them. And getting even more mindful about language and how to avoid, you know, what might seem to us as not a, a reason to feel triggered could be for another person a very strong trigger. So we're trying to take that out a little bit and guide people not towards, not back into this, not back into their stories about their unworthiness, but actually guide them towards this uh, deep appreciation of the body they got and the possibilities they have and appreciation through working with what they have, not trying to become something they are not, but actually discovering what is here. What happens when I inner rotate my thighs a little bit and, oh, look, that sensation in my lower back changed. And yeah, all of these um, experiences that people have with their bodies in the practice are hopefully leading them into a deep appreciation of themselves. And I think from the appreciation can grow something like even 
self-love and worthiness. We start with just knowing the body and knowing yourself more deeply, appreciating next step appreciation, and that appreciation can expand into an even greater sense of worthiness. Okay, the last topic is the tantric based themes. I'm going to squeeze that one in. So I noticed after a while, and I go in different phases, but I, I noticed, well, basically, because I had to start, I, I didn't have to, I, I chose to start teaching some weekly classes. And I was like, oh my God, I haven't done that for a while, you know. What's my heart theme? What am uh, what are my key actions today? And you know, I, I usually teach. The last three years, I just taught these eight hour days of trainings. You know, different concept, different different way of working in the room. And I quickly realized I, I want to, as much as possible, connect whatever I'm talking about with a tantric concept because then it makes what I'm talking about much greater than me. And I just started getting interested in whatever idea I had about my class, whatever I wanted to talk about, whatever it might be a, a current, you know, challenge I'm working with. Just to contemplate for a moment, what concept in, in yoga, it doesn't have to just be a tantric concept, but what, you know, I could even put it down to just, do I know a, a Sanskrit word that reminds me of this topic, reminds me of this issue I'm having, reminds me of it or helps me with it or supports me in that? And what I love about using the tantric-based themes is that the essence of the tantra, well, what we're doing is we're connecting this individual story this uh, not individual sorry that this story or idea that an individual person has we're connecting it to something universal and what I love so much about um, the tantric vision or the tantric um, perspective on life and reality is that it includes everything It includes everything and everyone. And let's not forget the Tantricas were the ones who even included women. Everyone and everything is included. And as I wrote that down in my notes just before, I thought, oh, my God, there probably wasn't a better time on the planet for a bunch of people to be practicing something that is rooted in the idea that everyone and everything is included. So you'll remember from your teacher training, some, what I, the, is it, it's the six, I think, the six qualities of the divine. So I always think that's a really good place to start. The Chit Ananda, then the three with the S, Sri Spandasvatantriya, and then Purna. That's how I remember them all. Chit Ananda, you can't do anything without Chit Ananda. And then the three with the S, Sri Svatantriya, Spanda, and then the one with the P, Purna. And I don't always find an immediate connection with one of those for what the story I want to tell or the thing I want to the, the idea I want to weave into my class, but it's, I always find it a very good place to start. And then otherwise, sometimes I go the other way and I look for a tantric concept. At the moment, I'm finding it super handy. Tantra Illuminated has a very good Instagram page. And I just go over to Tantra Illuminated and I look at some of the posts and then I'll see some beautiful Sanskrit word. I'm like, I have no idea what that word is. And then I'll read the post. Uh, and I'll just create a class out of it. So it's my study continues. That's the great gift, I think, of this, uh, this promise to offer the asana class with a theme. It forces me to continue my reflection and my, my developing my own personal relationship to the philosophy. 
And then what we do is we go and use these tantric based themes. And even if we don't mention the word Tantra, <laughs> because we're coming from that perspective and the perspective is everyone and everything is included, we, we are naturally going to offer, I think quite naturally going to offer something that is of support. Yeah. So I'd love to have you all um, offer a comment in the chat. What is that for you? What is a Tantric based theme? So Anasara yoga rooted in the tradition of Kashmir Shaivism, non-dualistic tantra, not to non-dualistic, not to everything is one. One reality created all this diversity. There's all this difference and yet behind the difference is one, is it, there's a one unifying field or one unifying energy the energy of life it is the same one and the one and the same energy of life pulsating behind all of this yeah. what is it for you what is a tantric based theme what what makes it a tantric based theme please have a little think about it because it doesn't have to be a specific sanskrit you know word like svatantriya you know, is it a is it a tantric based theme for you when it's revealing? Perhaps it's the moment when it's revealing the magic of life, the wonder, the beauty of life. That's what it might be for you. What is the tantric based theme for you? Please write something in the chat. So someone called Hana, I don't think I know this Hana. It's got a lot of truth to it. I like that. I feel like Tantra describes reality. Tantra philosophy in general is an attempt to describe reality. It has truth in it. I feel like a tantric based theme is also we look at the fact that there is a shadow, there is something difficult, there is something challenging, but we see that there's another side to that coin. That, that the very fact that that shadow exists is the reason that there is light on the other side. That for me is very much the tantric themes. And I think if you get very, um, clear for yourself what does that mean to you the, the tantric based thing when does it become rooted in a concept or an idea of tantra then you will find a very what do you what would i call that a, a common thread for your for your teaching yeah Okay, it's 10 past, so I want to wrap up. Yes, we are all one. Anything that's unifying, you know, that might be the thing that you go, for me, it's tantric based as long as it's unifying. Yeah. So Yulia told me to tell you guys further ways to study with me. So I'm going to do that very briefly because I think you're, I believe you're getting some kind of follow-up. Is it a follow-up email or something, Yulia? So there will be my web, web, uh, I have two web pages. What do you call them? Web, web, websites. Right. Yeah, I have two websites. Um, and the English website is currently in kind of a mess. I haven't got around to fixing that yet. Everything's still recovering from the pandemic, but I did do a new German website. Barbara No Yoga Academy .de. And this is where you'll see most of my uh, current trainings because most of my trainings at the moment, most of the things I'm doing at the moment are in German. So on my .com website, which will 
hopefully my goal is by the end of April that I have a brand new one. Uh, you can, uh, as of next week, you will see one new English language event and that is relevant to what we've been talking about here. And that is my, I'm going to be doing an open to grace retreat, Anasara philosophy and tantric, um, Anasara yoga and tantric philosophy. And that's going to be in Bali with my esteemed colleague, Soham Johansson from Copenhagen. And Soham is a very wonderful and special philosophy teacher. He's also um, a, a Hatha yoga teacher and he's also trained a lot and studied with the same teachers I studied with in Anasara yoga. And Soham, I mean, he studied, what did he do? He studied Vedic Sanskrit or something at university. So he has a great way of unpacking the Sanskrit concepts and wording and, and within the context of the history, the history of yoga. So that's going to be um, 24th to the 30th of September, if anyone would like to come to Bali towards the end of September. Um, that will be in English, Anasara Yoga and Tantric Philosophy. And then for the German speakers, I have the ATT modules coming up. Um, they're running from April till June. I have um, various... Uh, advanced teacher training modules that you can just look up on my website what they are like one's alignment one's sequencing one's therapeutic adjustments things like that there's going to be and it's not on my website yet there's going to be a heart themes intensive um, mid-october all of these are you can attend in person or online and the heart themes intensive i'm really looking forward to because i always feel like whatever training i offer there's not enough time to go deeper and really get creative and give everyone more time to develop their themes and practice teaching them. So it's going to be three days heart themes. And my other super favorite thing is to bring Ayurvedic, the Ayurvedic perspective into working with the structural uh, alignment. So that's my body freedom training, end of October. Yeah, 31st of October to the 5th of November. Body freedom is... Ayurveda, not in the sense of we're going to give each other oil massages. That's not happening. It's, it's the Ayurvedic wisdom and understanding of the five elements and the doshas and applying that to yoga sequences. And we do structural yoga therapy. There. So that's, that's one of the ones where I'm really about, you have to get people to, you insist upon them doing the actions. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to stay here for a bit in case you guys have questions. Otherwise, we are going to finish up with going to finish up with an om, and then you're finished. You're free to go, go to bed, or go and have a glass of wine, or go and Netflix, or whatever whatever else is happening this evening. And uh, after we've done the om, you're, you're free to go. I'm also going to stay here, just so you know. If you have questions or want to talk to me, I'm going to hang around. So please take your hands in front of your heart. I hope very much that there was some. Um, Maybe some good reminders, you know, maybe nothing new, but a couple of good reminders for you about, uh, yeah, the incredible richness and, and benefit to be gained from this practice. And I hope you feel supported in your work as a teacher or in your experience as a practitioner. Keep giving yourself the gold with your practice, a little kiss of gold here and there. Let's close with an om, inhale. Oh. Namaste.